Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Christine Lowe of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and it is my privilege to moderate this panel with a group of very senior and well-known built environment professionals from Hong Kong. Well, let me just start by saying something about Hong Kong and the wonderful things, as you all know about cities, is that they are clusters of civilization and dynamism. Every city has its special characteristics, and so does Hong Kong. Well, one of the things that everybody knows about Hong Kong is that it is one of the most urbanized cities in the world. It has some of the tallest buildings, it has many tall buildings, and it has about 7 million people. Um, one of the problems uh, that we are facing in Hong Kong is that we have an aging population that by 2050, 40% um, of the people will be over 65. But we also have a, a problem with our buildings because they're also fast aging. If we're talking about private residential properties, then in, nine, in 2016, we had 1,100 buildings approximately that were over 70 years old. But by 2050, the number is going to grow 300 times. So what are we going to do, especially with um, climate change? And one of the problems with climate change, as you know, is high heat. Now, of course, um, Hong Kong is subtropical, so people are used to high temperatures. But the problem with climate change is that the temperature will become much higher. People talk about extreme heat. And the other problem is um, hot days and nights are going to be much longer. Now, the threat to people is um, extreme heat has a bigger impact on older people. Now, the characteristics about Hong Kong people is also very interesting. Actually, our people enjoy the longest life expectancy in the world. Now, there, there are good reasons for this. One is we have one of the lowest infant mortality rates in the world. And also, actually, our people are relatively healthy. But as I said, there are some new threats and extreme heat is one of them. And as people know, as temperature adds towards the 40 degrees Celsius, basically things don't work very well in our bodies anymore. So the question that I have for the panel today is climate change, older infrastructure, aging population. Well, what are the risks and what are the opportunities for cooling the city and improving the infrastructure in the city? So I'm going to start by asking Brian, what do you see are the opportunities and the threats? Hi, thank you, Christine. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all here. Um, I think for Hong Kong, traditionally, um, we have a relatively fast pace of redevelopment. And I think that bring about because of its economic growth, where the land value increased enough to a point that redevelopment is possible. Um, having this double aging, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, in particular, I think what Hong Kong right now is facing, and it's quite strict quarantine, is really because of our aging population and the density of where people live in. So the, the virus can pass through a lot quicker. So because of that, the city has taken on a more stringent approach. And I think this is the so-called the downside of this high density living. But what it translates to, I think, is uh, the city over the last you know, 50, 60, 70 years, the redevelopment pace is so quick that a lot of the older development, smaller units are taken down to give sort of space for a larger high rise, even higher denser uh, environment. But having said that, um, it also created opportunity to upgrade its infrastructure, to have more sustainable uh, development in recent years, particularly in Hong Kong, uh, the vet, urban ventilation permeability has been added into the whole uh, city's so design approach. So buildings now is less, while they're denser, we have uh, a wind rose that government have studied. I think Professor Ed would help to do that. And by having that data with modern technology, we can start modeling where the summer prevailing wind coming through, winter winds come through, so we can design buildings to help to ventilate the buildings. So these are the strategies that uh, Hong Kong has adopted. And then the other side is also the uh, sort of placemaking public space. We're creating more larger public space that allow people to come in and gather. 
Um, the other thing which is quite interesting for Hong Kong is because of the high density environment, we start putting different programs, different uses together. And recently we have done a project where elderly living in a new development where aging population sort of elderly lives on below, their family members can live above. So they're close, but not too close in the same quarter. Um, and then we have another wing, because it's an urban, we have another section of the building is for clinics. So it's a new way of sort of high density mixed use uh, urban strategies that we start to have to have, not only to deal with olding or aging people, but a sense of community, which is important allow saying that the kids and the grandkids live upstairs, normal apartment, Downstairs, these apartments are designed for them to age with dignity and gracefully. So they're wheelchair ready. Uh, some of the the, lift, the elevator are larger to allow hospital or, you know, the, the ambulance uh, flat bed to go straight in. So these are some of the strategies Hong Kong adopted, which seems to work on the build them, building programmatically from the urban redevelopment side. Um, but there is a lot uh, older stock of older building that needs to be upgraded and not only to fight climate change in terms of extreme weather, but also, you know, floods and, and general health. Because after COVID, I think the event, um, sustainability, healthy city, uh, personal health, community health is also part of the considerations. Right. So Thank stop. you. Yeah. Now we'll come back and talk to you about uh, your vision for this new way of uh, living in a moment. But uh, Edward, since Brian mentioned that you're actually one of the guys in Hong Kong who've studied about how to site buildings, you know, to ensure that there's good airflow and so on, you know, so perhaps what's your perspective about risk and opportunities? We have been doing quite a bit of studies uh, to kind of help the urban environment in the past. And I'm I'm very happy that the, the profession and also the government have, uh, have taken some of the, the the ideas on board, and now requiring the our built environment to be uh, slightly better designed. But uh, I do not want to scare you. But then, uh, this is the this is the past. The future is going to be far more challenging. Recently, we have done a study to predict what is going to be the uh, the, the built environment situation in Hong Kong. In, uh, uh, until the end of the century, uh, we have found that, for example, nowadays that old people can uh, can can suffer. I would say, uh, say uh, twenty to thirty days of hot day and hot night per year. We have predicted that uh, by the end of the century, if things don't improve, they can suffer up to one hundred twenty days, i.e., four times. Basically, the entire summer from uh, from June to uh, uh, August. Uh, will be will be hot day, and the problem with that is that if you connect the hot days together, i.e., you have a prolonged period of heat wave, it has it has great uh, implication to mortality, i.e., people okay. is going to suffer and then they they, they will die. Uh, so so the, the problem tomorrow is not going to be solved by the solution yesterday. That is the one message. Whatever you are doing now, doing very well, will not work in 10 years time or in 20 years time so you really have to develop new and creative idea our built environment needs to have a fundamental review in order for it to cope with the future not to deal with the problem now but to cope with the future that is uh, one thing that we have found out and then we have some ideas as to how it may happen but it requires a coordination and it requires effort and it requires ingenuity like uh, like architects and 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 also the government's commitment and things like that. That's one thing. The second thing that we find out when we interview the older people is that there is no such thing as one older generation. That's it. There are different so-called older generation and they require a different kind of built environment. So there's no one solution that solves everything. You have to find a way to understand how different uh, uh, older people require their living environment to behave and then design appropriately. So I do not believe that we can develop one solution. I think that we have to develop many solutions so that people can choose how they can live their life in, in the future. And that's the second thing about uh, diversity and indi individuality that our built environment should be designed uh, towards. I think that the opportunity is that um, we require a lot of creativity. There's something that I think architects are very good at, and that is to see how we can solve problems creatively. So. 
So that is just that is just challenging. Of course, is the opportunities. So I look forward to seeing um, uh, things happening or, or being realized. For example, at the moment we are trying to promote a, a, a few new ideas to different uh, stakeholders and see how they would like to change their current way of thinking to uh, accommodate uh, some of these new ideas. So I see great uh, opportunities, uh, but also see great risk. Yeah, well, Edward, I'm so glad you reminded us of one very important um, feature of climate change is that whilst it's getting hotter today in the world, actually, we're looking out to the future and it's going to get much hotter. So everything that is bad today, it's going to get much worse. And so when you're designing for the future, um, we better be ready for much more extreme and severe uh, climate, including temperature in this place. And, you know, I know we're talking about elderly people, but actually um, also children don't tolerate high heat very well. So, you know, let's come back to some of these issues later on. So, MK, your view about risk and opportunities. Well, um, I would like to focus a bit more on the process and the tools. Uh, and, uh, well, I think the biggest risk is uh, we rely on the rely on the old world mindset and practice for the whole urban renewal process and we definitely should not um well the challenges of double aging actually are unprecedented in many sense and demanding proactive response interlinking well various aspect of economic social and environmental sustainability beyond, much beyond a single discipline can handle. And our approach to urban renewal actually needs to be shift from a single discipline uh, focus to multidiscipline integrated and from experience based to knowledge base. Some of the, well, the knowledge, the science uh, Edward uh, has talked about and some of the uh, well, the science knowledge about elderly and uh, well, building aging, urban aging. I think we all need to take account. And by multidisciplined, integrated, and knowledge base, I think the design and science needs to come together. And when they come together, core design disciplines like planning and land use, building design structure, building services, uh, not only uh, well they need to be considered independent, independently on their own merits, but also they need to work together and take account of the urban sustainability science to tackle the well the scale and the complexity and the dynamics of the changes. I think we need better solutions, better process, and better tools. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think, MK, um, you've reminded us of how we work together. And, you know, I think the four of us, we have at different times also cooperated um, uh, on some of these sustainability issues. But so I think maybe we can start by exploring this issue. All of you know, and MK, you've emphasized the importance of working together. And you know we're having to break new grounds to really deal with quite extreme challenges that are coming at us quite quickly. Um, you've, you've, all, all three of you have talked about the different disciplines working more together, thinking about the clients that you're dealing with, you know, the elderly people and generations and, and so on. And you all represent very deep reservoirs of knowledge in your area, but you're crying out for working with people from different sectors, government being one, and people from other disciplines, so that we can bring all this knowledge together. How do you think we can do that in Hong Kong? And I'm sure this, kind, this question is actually relevant for many other places as well. Brian, maybe from your point of view, I mean, you're, you're one of the best known architects in Hong Kong. You've built some of the uh, uh, award-winning buildings and you have a passion and a drive to build new buildings to address some of the yeah. issues. How do you work with government and others across discipline? Or what would you like to see that is not yet happening? I think what's what's really important, what uh, Professor would have saying, it's the extreme of weather, right? And, and Hong Kong obviously getting hotter. In Europe, it's getting colder and hotter at the same time. So 
it's it's ability where when everybody comes together to at least challenge some of those basic assumptions and remain humble and curious. What I find is when we are assuming that we are right, then it goes nowhere. I mean, everybody assumes they're right. So I think having that humility, it's really down to the knowing that we what we don't know. And very often you don't know what you don't know, that's the problem. So if you can open that mindset saying, hey, what I assumed or all my old assumption is thrown away, then you then you allow for new things to, to come together. And then for us in Hong Kong, historically the, the most challenging project often require a team that a team that realized the challenge first, recognizing it's, it's mission impossible. Then, okay, let's see what we can do, roll out our sleep and, and then test, and then willing to fail. I mean, these are just some of the quick, uh, you know, rapid prototyping sort of, sort of uh, uh, try and error. But ultimately, it's really the government able to accept that what they know before. The government very often, often reference backwards. So looking backwards, but going forward. And if we can all look forward and try to figure out what the path is, I think that's most important. And in the past, when we work with really good collaborators, um, everybody comes in with an open mind. Um, that's easier said than done. Uh, but I think it's important to check out ego at the door and then come in and say, hey, we have a big problem. How do we deal with this? And having science to show us where the big problems are often helps because everybody's imagination, the magnitude may be different. And science help us to just narrow that bandwidth a little bit. Right, Edward, you know, you, you have worked with government and they've accepted some of the science-based, evidence-based work that you've done in terms of how buildings should be cited and so on. So you have lots of uh, uh, experience working on government committees and so on. How can we do better so that we can be future forward in urban planning, in you know, retrofitting old buildings, building new buildings and so on? Uh, my, my experience working with the government and also the profession is that the first thing you must uh, achieve is that everybody believes that there is uh, something to be solved. If any, any, if there is one stakeholder in the entire chain that doesn't believe it, it will break down. So the first thing is that you have to believe that there is something that needs to be done and can be done. Okay, that's number one. The second one is to 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 acknowledge the the, the extent of the problem. I.e., I mean, to, I mean, if if the problem is small, then people put it in low priority and they try to solve another problem first before mm. they come to the real problem. So the the second thing that we we scientists can always do is to tell them the extent of the problem and whether or not this is the real problem for the society, and everybody have to buy into it. And before you can therefore set up the priority of 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 uh, works that you you wish to do. So I always believe that communication between uh, among the uh, stakeholders so that we can commonly believe in something and commonly know that the, 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 the problem is of a certain magnitude. Then the priority will come and then the solution will come. And the, the rest are, are pretty straightforward. It just requires effort. But then the, the, the first bit is to require value change. I, I think a lot of time people think that the one degree or two degree uh, increase in temperature is not a problem. So they always think that, I mean, uh, you, 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 that's not really a problem. That, that's what they say. But I always tell people that if, if I tell you that one degree means that uh, more than 2% more people will die and two degree means that more than 10% people will die, what are you going to talk about? What are you going to tell me? So I, I sometimes try to convert this uh, kind of meaningless some kind of degree or, or, or minor issue into something that really impacts human life. And ultimately, it's human life that we are we are building for, and we are we are trying to safeguard. So once that is converted, then people can see the extent of the problem, and then build up the common belief and also the priority list. I think that is the first thing that we must do. Once that is done, I think that the rest is technical. I would say. Hmm. Well, how far away are we from? Uh you know, from, from that, where we can bring people together so that we, we start from the same base, right? And acknowledge that uh, we need a new, you know, a new base to sort of move from. MK, any thoughts from you? Well, I think, uh, well, uh, knowing the problem, uh, well, you need to have that, uh, well, that uh, knowledge base. And the knowledge base of this uh, whole problem to solve this problem actually are very broad, as I have emphasized. Mm -hmm. So I think the first step to, um, in fact, to solve this problem is to build out a, a 
well, a great, capable team. And, uh, well, we ourselves actually has uh, been, well, uh, exploring the, the different team setup. And we have a research team working with the experienced architect. And that research team actually have diverse uh, professional backgrounds, uh, well, uh, by training. And, well, from sustainability master planning, community wellness, development, economics, uh, and sustainable healthy materials and the science. I think, well, but, well, we know that we cannot and we are not able to own all the knowledge. So we have to build our network and we do benefit a lot from uh, those close partnership and collaboration like uh, well with a lot of local and overseas universities like Edward well and we work with the best ed, uh, expert in their own areas just to enrich our understanding to define the problem well and I must emphasize that uh, well in the whole a planning process and the design process the most critical stage in fact i would say is at the very start as early as possible at the moment we do have a lot of very good uh, 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 tools and very sophisticated one help us to actually estimate uh well the the actual performance of our environment but well that needs that those two actually will need a lot of detailed information but when we have those detailed information it is already too late many of the design decisions have been locked up uh, in the process so i think the earlier the process and the better the tool that we can evaluate solutions and options at the very start of the process this is something i always emphasize and well, the, and this is something well, we are building uh, our capacity in house. So make sure that the whole process is integrated and putting this knowledge into practice. And uh, well, this is something well, we need to uh, work better. Right. I mean, you know, you're all extremely busy professionals um, designing buildings and so on. I mean, Brian, you talked about your building, you know, new ideas, uh, multi-generational in the buildings and so on, but you need a client who wants to do that. So you guys need clients, both in the public sector and the private sector. So, I mean, how do we educate potential clients? I, I think in the past, um, the what I experienced, I guess, last 15 years, is it's even clients evolve, right? Um, in Hong Kong, some of the clients are developers and sort of family business. But what was interesting is when the younger kids come back from their studies, they're full of fresh ideas. And and sometimes they, they can convince their father and sometimes uh, we can do small experiments and make them realize, hey, this is good. And I think most importantly is try to figure out what the older generations are concerned. Are they concerned just about profits or are they concerned about their brand or their own reputation? So if you can address the deep down issues that they have, then they can open up the door and allow you to, to do other things. Um, that's what I find is quite interesting is everyone has one or two things they really care about and they never say it. So maybe over some wine and dine and then they figure out, oh, he's really concerned about this and we can promise him building that trust that knowing that you will take care of what he concerned the most and then he would certainly gives you leeway or her gives you give us leeway to to experiment and, and looking at the last 15 years uh, Hong Kong have come a long way from sustainability we went from arguing with with the older generation it's really coming to oh how much can we do can we do more for this or slightly less so having that uh, seeing that change uh, give me hope and both other challenges, more extreme weather, um, energy crisis that the world will be facing, I think, this, this next few months, um, inflation, economic sort of challenges, uh, all these need to have a humble heart and then a, a brave mind as well to, to tackle. And But surprisingly, uh, the clients are not too bad. It just need to take care of what they really concern about. After all, we all driven by fear, and, and some of these climate issues are very fearful. 
Well, I mean, I, I guess uh, a private sector client, um, if you plumb how they feel about the future and what they're willing to do, right, you know, maybe that's actually a good opening for much more sustainable outcomes. But what about the public sector? Because after all, one of the problems that all cities have to face are the low income population. Uh, and we have some terrible conditions in Hong Kong in particular. Um, so, you know, some some ideas from Edward and MK about, you know, the, the public sector. Uh, my, my, well, I'm from the academic, so therefore I, I probably uh, can speak uh, things from, from, from a distance. I, I have a feeling that a lot of the time the, the, um, the construction industry or the built environment industry is quite short-sighted, uh, both public as well as uh, uh, private. I think, uh, 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 Christine, you talk about client, but I would like to focus our attention to what we call user, i.e. the market. I mean, uh, if, if the market is not there, developer will not design building in a certain way. Or if the market will change into a, in, into a certain direction, the developer are very clever and they will follow the market. So I, a lot of the time, I would like to focus our attention to the user or to the market both in terms of lower income people who needs the help of the government or the high income people who can afford to, uh, uh, to, to, to be a little bit better living in a better environment with the private industry. So, but a lot of the time when we, when we look at this situation, I, I find a little bit of short-sightedness in it. And that is, we always try to solve today's problem today. And, and not recognizing that solving today's problem may sometimes generate tomorrow's problem. And if we cannot e extend our mindset to something bigger, then basically we are creating problem for tomorrow by solving today's problem. So that is something that I, I wish the, uh, the, the, the industry uh, may, may, may not kind of indulge themselves too much into it. So, so if we can somehow find a way to focus the mar on the market or the people, and, and to look at the problem more holistically, i.e. try to solve the problem today and tomorrow, then I think we have a future to create a more sustainable and long-term environment than what we have been doing in the past. Because in the past, we can, we can very, very safely focus on something and, and do it very well. But tomorrow's uh, environment is changing. And, and if we do not do that, then, then tomorrow's uh, uh, climate is going to kill your building. So, 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 so cast your mind a little bit wider and try to look at the problem more holistically and look at how people require your built environment to behave in 100 years time. That could be a very good way to, to tune our mindset to, uh, to solve the tomorrow's problem. Well, you know, we're focused mainly on housing and, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to go into commercial property because they are they are different. But if we were to look at housing, so Hong Kong is actually still building uh, a lot of public sector housing. Um, the, the issue also is, do you see opportunities about retrofitting residential housing, whether they are public or private sector? Because, you know, one of the other things that Hong Kong is very famous for is we have very tiny housing. And some of the newer buildings are getting smaller and smaller because it's so expensive. So, Brian, you clearly have um, a vision for how people should live, intergenerational. Uh, you want to provide also health facilities and so on in, in buildings that are very close to each other for convenience and well-being and, and, and so on. Can we envisage living like that through retrofitting? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, we will have to do some retrofitting because we can't be all building new buildings. Um, what are some of the crazy ideas that you guys have? You know, I'm not going to hold any of you to crazy ideas. But when we're thinking about the kind of transformation that you're talking about, the open mindedness, the kind of conversations you guys really want to have with users, with government and developers. What are some of the crazy ideas? And Brian first and maybe MK. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's it's start from what people, what I was saying, right? what the market, what people really want. And I think ultimately, you got to start from, you know, family, community, right? Um, when, when you design places, whether it's old or new, and you, you need to look at the whole neighborhood just to see what the demographic is, uh, where are the places that you can retain as old and whether some you have maybe have to take them taken down if it's too dense to have better ventilation so climate climatically it is more healthy but then 
once you take something down, you have to re put that unit somewhere else and make it higher. So the whole district-wide planning strategy needs to be looked at. And now with technology, the whole shared economy or shared facilities, these are some of the things that we can start looking into, right? Share car park facility. Uh, parks can be obviously everybody can access, but also making it weather friendly. And then how do you consider using these public space as potential sponges for, for torrential, you know, extreme weather, uh, sort of you know rain situation um so all these things needs to be considered and future looking too right with autonomous vehicle probably coming in about 20 years do we still need car parks uh do we need still need roads uh, that's that's dense or parking space um urbanistically do we start thinking about 3d printing centers do we start thinking about logistical centers or even what they call dark kitchen now right instead of having retail uh, uh fmb outlet um we all called in and there's a dark kitchen that's five different restaurants all just a kitchen and then there's a logistics that that can start doing that so i think technology new ways of living can provide more opportunity for a better community and and then also mix using uh facilities to now with post covid world people start saying oh maybe i can work from home so your home needs to have some work space now Right, like tonight I'm at home and this is kind of my workspace throughout COVID. So even though unit design, the sizes need to be adapting to a more flexible environment. Um, but without doubt, the, the the market, I do feel that they want more flexibility, uh, the fluidity of, 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 of people working. Um, technology help us um, in that sense, but more technology, more social media also means people craving for more physical touch points face-to-face -face time become more valuable and creative work very often needs to meet face-to-face -face. um so we're redefining work as well so office home all these genres get mixed in and in a larger elderly setting i think as we age um with technology maybe we're more capable and we do want to see our grandchildren or even great-grandchildren if 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 are sort of keeping ourselves healthy. So the sense of community is important, uh, particularly I think in the Asian culture, we we love being close with our elderly parents or grandparents, or, but not too close. So keeping the healthy distance is also important. But um, some of the apartments that we designed, we hopefully allow people to age gracefully. So for example, the sh we don't get put in bathtubs, so we'll put in shower cubicles, but the shower, enable at some point their wheelchair can rolled in and rolled out um kitchen uh, sink that have units at the bottom that can take out and wheelchair can also go in uh wall sockets at about waist high so when you're on wheelchair you don't have to go down and plug in so these are small design features that we have already started designing to enable people to live in the same apartment without having to move out i mean leaving your home when you are 60 70 or 80 years old you, it's not very nice. So if they can sort of age gracefully in, in a place until they require assistance, uh, that would be a great way for for the dignity of, of hum the humanity. I think that's important. Right. Well, we have about six minutes left. So I think I'm going to go to MK. And, you know, Edward, I am going to give you the last word because I want you to critique what we're not able to do. I mean, of course, uh, I think Brian is uh, kind of painting out uh, an, uh, an older lifestyle that uh, is very attractive for maybe people like us. Um, but there are lower income people, we, you know, there are public housing and maybe the redesign or the retrofit in public housing can take some of the ideas that Brian talked about, you know. So, so MK, you go first. And then, as I said, um, I'm going to give you the last word, Edward, to be critical. MK. Mm -hmm. Right. I would like to approach the uh, challenge from a different angle, uh, not from a building fabrics, but uh, mm -hmm. on the social capitals, mm -hmm. how we may well address the issues of uh, our aging community from that. And uh, we are working on the research, actually quite a crazy ideas. We are working with uh, our network uh, about uh, digital tech, and we're looking at how blockchain technologies may be employed to create a more inclusive community and society. 
And uh, the ideas we are having is, uh, well, in fact, to build community engagement, uh, well, and integrate with a time bank idea. So the community can help the community. The community can be actually be mobilized and they well and the good doings can be registered uh, uh in in a, a community where well they they help the elderly and they also support the caregiver of the neighborhood so the whole thing will uh, actually be uh, uh well um uh, uh, people helping people ideas so i guess uh well of course the uh, well the aging building needs to be addressed but the most of our hong kong buildings actually they can stand for 60 70 years with uh, well repair and actually maintenance and hong kong is good at that uh, for majority of our uh, public sector and private sector but that we need to be careful of some buildings which uh, we call the three NEOs, which uh, they have uh, very low building man, uh, maintenance support, and then those need particular attention. But the, on top of that, I think we need to come up with uh, well something that well people need to actually reaching out to people. Those um, elderly actually needs connection with people and social interactions. I think this is something, well, um, uh, as a research group, uh, we go beyond architectural discipline. And then this is something we are working on at the moment. Thank you, Edward. In less than two minutes, your final contribution to us. Uh, the, the double aging problem is indeed a big problem in Hong Kong. Um, but a lot of time when people talk about that, they, they talk about retrofitting the existing building uh, as if it is the end of the the, 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 uh, the problem. But however, I would like to cast the, the understanding a little bit wider. Retrofit for what? I mean, you're not going to solve all the living uh, conditions of the, uh, of the older population by just retrofitting the, his house or his home. I think a lot of the time, I think I agree with uh, Brian that we have to look at the living environment as a whole. So indoor, outdoor, the connectivity, there's social engagement capability and all these other things. And, and in order for you to do that, you have to understand the people first. A lot of the time we need to talk to the old, uh, older population to know what they need. That is the first step. And then to decide what we should do uh, to, to help them. So I would like to kind of uh, hope that uh, the, our, our, the construction industry can look at our building environment more holistically. Don't, don't just uh, say that you, you solve the problem uh, inside the four wall and behind the locked door, you're okay. You're not okay. So if you look at it uh, more holistically, then the solution will come because people, people know how to move around. And if you allow that to happen, people know how to live their life uh, in, in a slightly bigger environment and, and therefore, your your probability of getting the right solution will be higher, and that with creative thoughts, of course. So, so as as always, I, I hope to just kind of jump jump back a little bit and and look at the bigger picture to solve the bigger problem. Don't don't just solve one problem at a time. You're not going to solve all of them eventually. So that is my hope that uh, our industry leaders can uh, can make reference. All right, well, great. Thank you for your great ideas. I think we should take uh, this discussion further when we are all back in Hong Kong. Uh, and in fact, this is a great global discussion. And the main thing I want to emphasize is that we want to turn the ideas uh, that you are putting forward into actually an attractive and doable economic growth and development strategy. Because I think only through that, when governments and others can see that the pathway that you are laying out is actually uh, something that is sustainable economically, rather than to say these are all costs that we cannot afford. So thank you, gentlemen. It's been a great conversation with you all.